God bless you guys. Um, I pray that you guys have been blessed and I pray that you guys were blessed by the last video. And so now in this video, we are going to talk about the healing of the mind. I think that it's really important to touch on this topic because this is not something that's spoken about often in the church when it comes to the actual mind being healed. We usually talk about physical healing and whatnot, but I've heard very few ministers talk about the mind actually being healed, and so I believe that it is really important for us that um, in this next part of healing ministry, we talk about the healing of the mind because it is just as important as emotional healing. In fact, in many ways, emotional healing sets us up to receive mental healing. Therefore, pairing up with emotional healing it is also our duty to be instruments of healing for the mind so we pair up emotional healing and mental healing together in this topic of healing ministry because there are too many people who have experienced mental trauma and they are living their lives feeling hopeless and Jesus cares about our mental health so he wants to heal it and we need to bring this hope to others but what causes mental pain there are many things that can contribute to pain in the mind people who experience trauma and abuse are often left with a lot of mental wounds and emotional wounds they constantly relive the abuse they endured and this can cause them to be unstable. Mental trauma can also be demonic in nature, and therefore, this has to be discerned. You have to discern whether the mental trauma that is being experienced is something that is natural or supernatural. And then you need to divide the two. Sometimes they could be intertwined with each other, but oftentimes it's one or the other. And so, let me give you some signs of trauma. A lot of these signs of trauma are things that I personally have witnessed people who experience trauma uh, manifest. These are signals that people will often demonstrate when they have been through trauma. I myself have been through some of this at some point, and so I could also personally identify with some of these symptoms, but it's important for you to be able to recognize these symptoms because when you're ministering or when you're engaging with someone in conversation or whatever, they might be sending you signals that they're being triggered, and you need to be able to pick this up. So some signs of trauma are a constant verbal repeating of the events. People who just repeat what happened to them over and over and over and over and over again. They just keep on talking about it. And after a while, it could get annoying. But this is why I'm teaching you how to process things. Because then you could help that person actually process their trauma and not dwell in their trauma. Another sign is people who don't want to be touched. Most of the time, people who don't want to be touched by others is because they have experienced a form of abuse. And, trigger warning, most of the time, it is sexual abuse whenever people don't want to be touched. I personally have experienced this and I have seen this happen many times where a person doesn't want to be touched hugged nothing and so therefore I personally don't buy it when people just say oh that's just how I am I just don't like hugging I just don't like being touched or whatever and I have other reasons as to why I feel that way that goes into much deeper revelation in regards to things that are generational but that's another conversation 
But nevertheless, a sign of trauma is that you don't want to be touched. Another sign is sudden anxiety or panic. It just happens out of nowhere. You're having a good day. You're in a crowd. You're having a cup of coffee. And then suddenly, anxiety just starts to shoot up. Or you hear someone say something to you, and you start to panic out of nowhere. You can't understand why you're panicking. You just know that you are. And so that's a sign that you have experienced trauma. And oftentimes when it comes to anxiety and panic, this could also come in a very subtle manner. Not everyone realizes that this is a sign of trauma. And so you would have to do a lot of thinking and tracing back into what the trauma could be. And that would take the leading of the Holy Spirit. And you may also need to see a counselor. We might talk about that in a minute. Another one is a fear of crowds. No matter how small, I have seen this happen to people who have been through trauma. They hate crowds. It doesn't matter how small it is. They just hate crowds because they feel vulnerable. They feel like they're going to get hurt. There is a loss of control. Which brings me to the next sign of trauma. Control issues. People who have control issues often exhibit signs of trauma. Because there were times in their life where they were not in control. And the trauma they experienced resulted in that. Therefore, to try and feel like they're in control... They try to control things that are small, that don't matter, or that shouldn't be a big thing to worry about. This is why I personally have come to the conclusion, just through experience and observance, that people who are OCD are people who have control issues. And they've probably experienced trauma. If you move and if you, if there's someone who's OCD in the sense where they want everything neat and you move one thing out of alignment, it just bothers them because suddenly they don't feel like they're in control and subconsciously they're being triggered to a memory where they were not in control. Or it could be something else. It could be something rearranged in a different manner and a person could start to freak out. Because it's not how they want it. But let's continue. Another sign of trauma is drugs, alcohol, and sex addiction. You want to numb your pain. You don't want to feel. You don't want to feel the, the trauma anymore. You just want it to go away. And so you try to numb your pain or forget about your pain by... Uh, engaging in these what could be harmful acts to try and numb that to try and make it all go away and then you do it more and more and more because it only goes away for just a moment and then it comes right back knocking on your door another sign of trauma is oversensitivity Oversensitivity. And this was me being oversensitive to everything. Any little thing could make me cry. Any little correction could make me cry. And even if I wasn't being corrected, if it felt like it was a correction, I would start crying. And I never understood why growing up. I never understood why I was so oversensitive about everything. And then I realized, as I spoke about a little bit in the last video, a lot of what I went through, it was because of the trauma I experienced that created me to be oversensitive. So then, throughout the years, I've had to undo that. And I've had to... Part of that was through therapy. 
part of that through healing, through deliverance, part of that just through maturity growing up, realizing that it's not always my fault, realizing that I'm not always being corrected for something. And another thing too that was over, that I was oversensitive about was when people would try to make jokes to me, when they would try to uh, joke with me, but it felt like they were joking, they were making me the joke. And that's beca because I was bullied, and so I couldn't distinguish at the time the difference between someone that's actually laughing with you versus someone laughing at you. I would automatically interpret it as someone was laughing at me. But I had to learn that not everyone's laughing at me. There are people who are actually going to laugh with you. So that was another part of oversensitivity that I had to eventually overcome. And there are times where I still deal with it occasionally. But when it comes up, I check myself. And I check and trace back where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? And Lord, how do I deal with this right now? And then I deal with it. With how the Holy Spirit guides me. So now let's look in Mark chapter 5, verse 1 to 8, and let's look at the demoniac's tormented mind. This is one of my favorite stories in scripture. It's one of the most powerful stories that I've ever written, that I've ever read, excuse me, that I've ever read. Um, and I always find it fascinating every time I read this story, the power of Jesus. So let's read. They went across to the lake of the region of the garrisons. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs, and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? In God's name, don't torture me. For Jesus has said to him, Come out of this man, you impure spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, Send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission, and the impure spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this in the town and countryside, and the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus and saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Let's pause a moment. The man who was possessed by legion, he was sitting there, he was dressed, and in his right mind. And the people were afraid because they were so used to seeing him in the state he was in that when he transformed, he was unrecognizable. They couldn't believe this was the man. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed began to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your own people and let them and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he's had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him 
and all the people were amazed. Not only was this man healed from demons, but do you realize how much torment he was in? That clearly did a number on him mentally. But the Lord also brought healing to his mind in the process. There are some of you who are watching this today and you're listening to me and you have been getting tormented mentally by demons or by your own thoughts. I'm here to tell you in the name of Jesus, peace be still. God is about to do something wonderful in your life. Just hold on. Jesus is the healer. He wants to heal your mind. And I believe he will today. So now let's look at some methods of healing the mind. Number one, you need to create an atmosphere of healing. One way to do this is you could create retreats conferences or prayer meetings dedicated to the healing of the mind pray specific prayers that involve jesus going into the mind of the person and doing supernatural surgery on the person i believe that that could be something very powerful and so i encourage you guys to try that email me and let me know what happens hallelujah this is something that will take time, dedication, and more than just one hour of prayer time. This is where the anointing for the miraculous will need to be present. You could also do worship music where people can just sit and meditate on God's work, God's word, and welcoming him to come and be the healer of their mind. Number two, recommend a therapist. Again, I am not anti-medicine, not anti-doctors. Some of you need to take your medication. Be honest. Some of you, it might not be demons. You might just need to see a doctor or see a therapist. Sometimes there is only so much we can do on our own. There are times where you need someone who is a professional to help you deal with the webs in your head. There is a reason that the Lord put doctors on the earth. The Lord in his great wisdom has placed certain things in order so that we can experience healing as a society. The Holy Spirit then empowers those he has placed to do the great work that is needed to be done. You need to know your limitations sometimes and learn how to refer people. Listen, there are some people that I just cannot help. With all my knowledge and wisdom and experience that I have so far, there are people I can't help. There are people I need to refer to a doctor or to another minister. And that's okay. That's part of being a good minister is knowing your limits, knowing when you're out of your league. We need to park our pride and stop trying to be everyone's savior. And so I want to just give a little bit of science here, believe it or not. And this is going to be part of restoring the brain in prayer. Bear with me because I don't know how to pronounce some of these names. The, amnig, the, amnig, the amnigdalia, dala, the amnigdala is involved in fear and fear memories. This is a part of the brain. The hippocampus is associated with declarative and episodic memory as well as recognition memory. The, salib, the, the, cerebellum, the cerebellum plays a role in processing procedural memories such as how to play the piano. So you could use these names while you're praying for a person's brain to restore it in certain areas. I'm giving you a creative tool here, knowing certain parts of the brain that you could pray for, for healing. Other parts of the brain are the prefrontal cortex. 
which appears to be involved in remembering semantic tasks. The frontal lobe is the part of the brain that, in, that, that controls important cognitive skills in humans, such as emotional expression, problem solving, memory, language, judgment, and sexual behaviors. The subconscious in psychology, the subconscious is the part of the mind that is currently not in focal awareness. And so I want to, again, the reason why I am telling you guys this and Bear, forgive me for not saying all the names correctly and stumbling over my words. Some of those names are hard to pronounce. Uh, but I want to dig deeper into this to perhaps create specific prayers that target these areas by name, which is why I chose to um, target this in particular because I've never heard anyone in healing ministry uh, mention these different names of the brain that could be that you could actually pray healing over and so let me give you another quick story I remember a professor of mine who gave a story about things that he was dealing with with his brain there were certain things that which is not functioning correctly the way that he knew it ought to. But he had to get to a point where he completely surrendered to the Lord. And when he surrendered to the Lord, especially when it came to certain things that I won't name, he described it as like, during his prayer time, he described it as like an electric shock hitting his brain. And there was a miraculous healing that took place. And so he declared and came to the conclusion that God even gave him new brain cells. And so I believe that that is a really powerful story. I had never heard of anything like that before and I thought that was a powerful story. And I have began praying that prayer over people. God, give this person new brain cells in the areas where their brain has been damaged. And so Philippians 2 verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Romans 12 2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The whole point is that God wants our mind to be renewed, transformed, and to be like Jesus. Not in the decaying state that it gets into because of sin. And so, since the battlefield is in the mind, I do believe that there comes a point where we need to target it as a place that needs physical healing. So I have developed a prayer that involves praying for the brain. And so this does involve praying over a person. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the pers a person's name. I'm just going to pick a name. So for example, I'm going to say Bob. Okay. It's a typical example to use, right? For a name. But this is the prayer. Dear Jesus, I ask that you would bring healing to Bob's brain. I ask for any brain cells missing that shouldn't would be restored in Jesus' name. I plead the blood of Jesus over Bob's brain. I also ask that you would bring healing to their subconscious. Clean the walls of their subconscious and fill it with the sanctifying fire of the Holy Spirit that purifies all things. Jesus, I ask you to seal this work within Bob. In your name I pray. Amen. 
And so I pray that that blessed you and that that encouraged you. I pray that the Lord would continue to move in your life. And may that give you fresh perspective on certain things when it comes to the healing of your mind. I pray that you were able to meet with God today. God bless you guys. And see you in the next video.